So it was initiated in 2017 by Laurent Fabius, the COP21 president, and Yann Aguila, the uh, president of the Global PAC Coalition. Um, and it's important to mention actually that uh, even before 2017, um, the idea of creating this legally binding, um, this sort of legal instrument has been um, the topic of many discussions since the Stockholm Declaration. Um, but the reason why it was initiated in 2017 is because um, increasingly uh, people were noticing the deficiencies in international environmental law. So what we mean by that is the, the shortcomings, the things that should be improved. Um, so if we just take a look at the table um, for each instance where there is a deficiency in international environmental law, the pact um, is a, uh, provides a possible solution. So the first one is fragmentation um, of international law. And basically that means that the existing principles um, and existing um, law that's out there on environmental protection right now is very fragmented. So it, they could be in sectoral specific uh, conventions, for example, on biodiversity or on pollution. And there's no um, cross-sectional uh, legally binding global framework and the pact would um, would be that framework um, it would enshrine the key principles and also those rights and duties that haven't yet been enshrined um, into a legally binding document so this actually the benefit of this goes into the second uh, one on the table which is uh, there's a lack of clarity in international environmental law and um, what the pact would do is strengthen and harmonize those principles so that there's more consistency at the international level and it would then filter down at the national level so that national legislators would have a point of reference um, when they're developing and drafting legislation. Uh, thirdly, there are significant gaps in um, the law. So um, we've touched upon the right to a healthy environment and that's, um, that's really the cornerstone of the pact. So what it's intending on doing is promoting a human rights based approach to environmental protection. And we'll come on a bit later to um, the developments with regards to with regards to this side. But yeah, just know that it's a human rights based approach. Um, fourthly, the lack of certainty. So this um, when I talk about codification, this is important because often there are soft law um instruments and although they might be obligations they're not legally binding so they they don't necessarily have to be enforced and this is um a chance to really give clout to those um key environmental um principles and lastly um a lack of predictability so all of the above um will facilitate uh, the enforceability by judges at the national level and provide citizens with the tools to implement the, the principles through access to justice, um, uh, et cetera, and access and participation. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Frances, for that amazing introduction. Uh, thank you, Georgia, for that first approach uh, to the pack, because I know it will be very useful to understand what's coming next. And what's coming next is maybe the answer of a question that some of you may have now. And it's just before we talk about what makes the pack different from the actual international environmental law framework, we should think or we should talk about why do we need a global pact for the environment when there are so many international environmental law principles that already exist. So I will say that there are three main reasons to say that we need a global pact. First, as Georgia was mentioning before, we have so many existing multilateral agreements that we have adopted that are fragmented in scattered areas. So there are many environmental treaties that exist, but they are often on different topics and separate from one another. For example, we have the Paris Agreement that talks about climate change. We have so many agreements to protect biodiversity and so many other examples. But we need 
one international overreaching framework that is uh, legally binding and that also compromises all the environmental rights and responsibilities. Second, we have gaps in the implementation of these uh, agreements and all that international framework that already exists. We have disparate laws and principles that cur currently exist that are not necessarily implemented right now. This means that there is a lack of uniformity between countries. So uh, we have lack of uniformity between countries with regard to key environmental principles. This is due to a lack of effective sanctions in international environmental law. And finally, we have a third reason that is that the current international environmental laws that exist are not legally binding and they're often only declarations. Therefore, these states do not have any obligation to implement the rights and duties included in those declarations in their national law. This is why we're pushing for a pact that is legally binding. But right now, we must ask ourselves, what does legally binding means in practice? I mean, legally binding will mean that all the countries have the obligation to respect the rights and duties that are enshrined in the global pact. So if a state do not respect its obligations under the treaty, the citizens will then be able to sue their own governments so that a court can declare there was a violation of the treaty and this that the state must comply. Here, I must say that although there isn't yet a global pact, people right now are suing their own governments for not respecting the actual international environmental law frameworks because governments, countries in general, they're not doing anything or they're not doing so much to fight climate change with punctual actions. This is called the climate litigation. I would say that is the global trend with some iconic cases such as the Urgenda case in the Netherlands, but also the Grand Seed case in France. So now that we have talked about why would we need a global pact, we must now talk about what makes the pact different and also what innovation does the pact bring about the protection of the environment, but from a legal standpoint. So here we can say a lot of things. First, that taking into account that we have a few gaps in international environmental law, such as, uh, for example, we have not been success, uh, successfully yet in creating a strong international environmental treaty and that we have difficulties in implementing the more than 250 existing multilateral agreements, we, we need that the PAC uh, have some characteristics so that makes an innovation and to make it different from what it exists. So I will say that what makes different the PAC is first that the, this global PAC will be legally binding will also facilitate the coherency and the harmonization of international environmental law. And this pact will also be applicable and usable to all and by all around the world. This world global pact will entails also the protecting the environment and repair. And I think that this is the one of the main purposes, repair environmental damages. Also, this pact will entail respecting the precautionary principle that is a very important principle in the environmental law uh, in general. Also, this part will uh, entails integrating that the objectives of sustainable development into public policies and also informing citizens and enable their participation during the process of taking environmental decision. So to finish this part, I will say that the whole purpose of the Global Pact for the Environment is to regulate the environment as a whole, not only by some topics. We need to regulate the environment as a whole. So we have to include air pollution, biodiversity protection, climate change, and all that stuff. The aim of this Global Pact is to globally recognize the founding principles and rights of environmental law.
Thank you very much, Juan, for that. Um, so let's take a look at the, the contents of the pact. Um, as I mentioned before, there was a preliminary draft uh, made in 2017 uh, by a group of international legal experts, and that contains 26 articles. So just before we go on, it's probably worth mentioning that this, um, this document is a draft, which means that it's a suggestion um, of how such a legal instrument could look, but there's no um, constraint on states. If they have a word to adopt such an instrument, they wouldn't necessarily have to stick to that. It's just, um, just a sort of a guideline or yeah, a draft. So let's take a look at some of the principles, rights and duties that are within the draft. Uh, on the left here, we have some of the key principles. So some of you may recognize these, um, non-regression, so no backtracking on the level of environmental protection, um, polluter pays, intergenerational equity, um, which might be a little less, less well known, and that um, basically ensures that the future generations um, are, are sort of protected um, from uh, today's uh, damages, I suppose. So it's all about thinking about the well-being of future generations. Uh, prevention and also something that Juan touched upon, integration of sustainable development. So that's important when we're thinking about uh, policy, uh, ensuring that the sustainable development, which is essential, um, is actually integrated into new policies um, and policy development. So it's really key when um, thinking about these next couple of years, when there's going to be a real push towards reaching net zero, for example. Um, so if we move on to the rights, the right to a healthy environment is really the cornerstone of the pact. Um, it's, it's really the heart of this human rights based approach. And actually, um, earlier this year, the uh, UN General Assembly recognized that the right to a healthy environment um, is a human right. So uh, this is a huge victory um, for the team and just for the international um, law uh, ecosystem in general. But that being said, it's still only a resolution. It's soft law and it's not legally binding. So this pact would um, codify that and uh, render it legally binding. Then we also have the tools that would enable the citizens to implement these principles. So we have public participation, environmental justice, and access to information. So it's really about um, ensuring that, you know, not just we are aware of those principles and they're all in one document, but also having the means to, um, to sort of invoke them in law and really invoke your rights as a citizen. And finally, the duty to take care of the environment, um, which it's important to codify as well. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Uh, now we are going to uh, um, present uh, the ambassadors uh, a light note to progress and next steps uh, of the pack. So I think it's still like Georgia. Thanks, Frances. So I'll just um, quickly mention the progress that we've made so far and the next steps. So as I mentioned before, the first draft was created in September 2017, and that's when President Macron presented it to the UN at the World Summit in New York. Um, then we move on to a year later in May 2018, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution um, called Towards the Global Pact for the Environment. Um, but unfortunately, the negotiations, even though they opened up, they weren't unsuccessful. Um, and again, the following year in May 2019, there was no consensus at the third session of the working group on the adoption of this text. So one of, the, well, the reason for that is because um, there needs to be consensus. So um, the USA, Brazil and Russia were opposed. And this is why there was, um, there was no text adopted. 
So skip past the, the COVID years to July 2022. Uh, earlier this year, the UN General Assembly recognized the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. So as I was saying before, this is a huge victory um, for well, people around the world um, to recognize this as a, a human right is really um, a milestone and it's really important in recognizing the overlap between human rights and you know this uh, the environmental rights and notably that we have that right to a healthy environment but as I mentioned this is a resolution this isn't legally binding um, so what I can say about that is it does um, it does suggest that the international context is changing. I mean, this is a huge step forward and the momentum from this, we should use this momentum to push for um, a pact, which includes this human right. Um, and so this is what brings me to our goal for 2023. So the ultimate goal is to initiate a round of negotiations for a legally binding treaty. So actually the pact could be adopted in a different form. I mean, it, it could be a political declaration, for example, but what we're pushing for is the most ambitious form, um, which would really give it that clout, that legally binding um, nature. And um, in order to do this, we really need to grow the global pact coalition. So the network of support behind it, because that's really what drives um, this whole initiative. Uh, so I'll, um, I'll let you take over, Frances. Thank you, Georgia, again. And uh, I wanted to thank uh, Juan Pablo and Georgia for the first part of this presentation. It was great. Now we're going uh, on to talking about the ambassadors and the ambassador role and what it means, uh, what are the stakes of the ambassadors. So I will give um, the I will let uh, Sylvan and then Pedro uh, present. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sylvan, as Francis just mentioned, and uh, I am a Global Pact Ambassador from Canada. And I'm going to be talking about um, who the ambassadors are, uh, how we fit into the Global Pact Network, and, and what some of our, our varied, role, varied roles are, um, mostly from my own experience. And I'll talk a bit about the experience of some of my colleagues. And then uh, Pedro will conclude our, our section with um, why the ambassadors are so important to the, the promotion of the pact and eventually the adoption, we hope. Um, and uh, and then he'll talk about how you can join the movement and uh, do some of the stuff that, that we've been talking about in this presentation here. So the, the Global Pact ambassadors are um, an international group made up primarily, though not exclusively, um, as you've seen from our, our presenters today, of students, um, recent students and uh, and mostly those studying uh, law, but um, I'm not studying law myself. I'm an economic student um, and a political science student. And so um, there's kind of quite a quite a mix mix of us. So uh, if if you don't know a lot about international law or if you this is the first time you're kind of hearing of a, a major international law treaty, don't don't worry. I heard about this in my uh, undergrad international law class and and, and joined from. From there, and uh, and I've been doing a lot, um, some work for the past uh, two or three years with the pact. Um, so um, today, you've seen a few of us from the UK, Colombia, and Canada, but we have colleagues in the US, uh, Niger, um, Cameroon, China, and uh, Japan, just to name a few of the other countries uh, where our, our pact um, ambassadors come from. And uh, we're all um, united by our commitment to the principles of the Global Pact for the Environment and our. Uh, belief that international law um, can and has made the world a better place and our hope that uh, that we can use the global pact to, to protect the environment. Um, so next, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do and what the role of the ambassador is, if you just want to move to the, uh, the next slide there. Um, so I've been an ambassador since I think 2020. Um, so when I started, the pandemic just hit. So a lot of the ideas that we had planned uh, sort of got shut down or, or delayed because we couldn't um, do kind of in-person activities. So a lot of our work has been sort of online, meeting with each other and uh, and creating uh, campaigns and, and actions that can promote the pact. And, and I think we hope 
um, and have in, in the past done a few kind of in-person activities. Some ambassadors have attended climate conferences on behalf, of, on behalf of the Global Pact. So it's really kind of a wide variety of activities. But, um, but myself, I've participated in a number of um, campaigns, um, meetings with uh, kind of other Pact members, um, uh, stakeholders, and, uh, and uh, the core Pact team who uh, are primarily based in France. Um, and for those of you who are also busy students, don't worry, it's not a large time commitment. I've been doing this for kind of three, almost three years now. And you sort of engage when you can, you, you take on more responsibility when you can, sorry. Um, and uh, and we will um, we'll kind of participate in, in campaigns that are organized primarily by the core team. Um, for my, my part, I have uh, worked with a small group of um, people from South America, Europe, and uh, and uh, North America to develop an outreach campaign for for indigenous uh, groups. So we we talked to uh, certain um, kind of broad coalitions of of indigenous peoples and and worked with them to see if they were interested in the principles of the pact, if they had anything to contribute, and uh, and if they were interested in in supporting us. And that was kind of a really interesting experience because um, we brought uh, we brought a lot of of ideas together. We heard from indigenous people what. Uh, what their ideas were about the global pact and how it fit into their kind of worldview and, and frame of mind, depending on where they, they were from, which was again quite varied across the world. Um, and and then I've also been involved in in contacting politicians, lawyers, um, and academics um, throughout throughout the time here. Um, as I, as I mentioned before, um, I think another ambassador went to COP twenty six on behalf of the global pact and and presented it um, not in a formal setting there, but in kind of informal. Um, activities around around the COP and gave out merchandise and stuff. So really being an ambassador is, is what you make of it. Um, it's it's uh, it's the goal is to promote the global pact for the environment in your in your country um, or your or your bigger region um, and within your your personal network as well and, and to represent the pact where you can, but you really get in what you put out or get out what you put into it. And so uh, so if you want to take on all sorts of responsibilities and, and come up with your own um, ideas, you can and and if you don't want to um if you just want to engage in the core team's campaign uh that's that's what a lot of uh, our, our members do as well if you're a bit more time constrained um and so as, as you can see on this slide here being um sorry uh but could you go back to the last slide there thank you uh the, the global pact is part of a broader coalition um one of the um or sorry the ambassadors are part of a lot of pro Co coalition, um, as Georgia mentioned earlier, uh, the Global Pact Coalition really tries to bring together the um, supporters of the pact. And when there are key negotiations going on, like there was at the UNGA last year, it works to um, put pressure on the states, on governments, through civil society mobilization, uh, through um, a communication. I think one example that the pact shared recently is during COP27. Um, the uh, the um, negotiators wanted to remove the right to a healthy environment from the communique, the final communique, which had been put in there at Glasgow, and the Global Pact mo Coalition mobilized to put pressure on states, and um, and the uh, right to a healthy environment ulti ultimately ended up being included in the kind of political de declaration at uh, at COP twenty seven, which is really cool. Um, again, it's not ultimately what we're working towards, but it's it's a great step along the way. And um, and if I think if you move to the next slide, you'll start to see. Who some of these people are? Um, it's uh, it's academics, it's professionals, it's uh, economists like Jeffrey Sachs, um, and activists like uh, Trisha Shetty. But it's also a few uh, celebrities uh, and ex politicians like Arnold Schwarzenegger or or you know uh, Sting. And um, and I think and then we also work with a, a broad group of NGOs, which I think the next slide will show. Um, we're really proud to have the support of uh, of things like BirdLife and uh, Stop Ecocide and uh, the um, uh, European uh, Environmental uh, Bureau. So um, it's just kind of a broad group of people who are all united behind the same goal to provide a human rights-based approach to, to environmental uh, protection. And I think I'll, I'll pass it over to, uh, to my colleague, Pedro now. Thanks, Yulun and Georgia and Alfardo and Frances. So, well, I believe I will just tell you how, how my experience at the PAC has been for the past, I believe, the same time as Silvan, so two years or so, just before the pandemic started. And um, 
Well, we we just got involved thanks to a class we were taking at the um, at Sciences Po. It was uh, global environmental governance with Jan, and um, with our other students, we we received the invitation to be part of the global environmental pact as as ambassadors. Um, well, I believe the experience is pretty much uh, common or kind of regular for for the ambassadors since uh, our job is not honestly a job it's just to connect with ngos or with the institutions being that public private um, companies people professionals students um etc that are willing to to be um to promote the pact to support the pact um and this is basically the main function. Aside from that, uh, invite other people to be part. So for example, I told Juan Pablo about the pact uh, about a year ago, and uh, and now he's an ambassador as well. It took a while, but but he's here at the moment. And um, yeah, so it works. It's not, as, as Silvan explained, it's not really demanding. Uh, we, we all have different professions. In my case, I'm, I'm about to be a lawyer and I have a full-time job. and. And it's okay. Yeah, it's busy. It's sometimes it's not easy, but still, uh, you you can make it. And um, now, how you how you can be part of the of the pact is basically sending your CV and a motivation letter uh, to an email that I believe uh, Frances can 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 give uh, at the end. And um, and well, so aside from that, what's the link between the individuals that support the pact and the pact's actual? Adoption and what that support mean? Well, uh, supporting the pact basically means that uh, you're helping the team of ambassadors, so everyone who is an ambassador, uh, to spread to the world and to your region in particular about the global pact for the environment. So, uh, as many people as possible must be informed about the pact. So, uh, if you have, for example, links with media and and, and institutions uh, like uh, universities and schools, that's that. That's super useful, and uh, sorry, the camera is going down. Oof. And um, and of course, the idea is to uh, to inform that the, like about the global pact, but about what what it contains and and what it seeks. So uh, that there is a possibility to protect the planet, it's not just like words, uh, the biodiversity, our health, and our future. Uh, the idea is that if enough people and civil society organizations put pressure on governments to adopt the global pact for the environment and the pact ends up being adopted one day, um, it will be th thanks to the support that every ambassador and, and, and people um, that has supported the pact uh, has, has made it happen, basically. So it's, uh, it's kind of more of a civil society action. It's not uh, something uh, like formal or, or, or professional. It's 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 an NGO, so it's um, that's how it works. And uh, I believe Frances will will take over now. Uh, thank you, Sylvan and Pedro, uh, for your presentation and for um, all of this, uh, for explaining how to become a, a PACT ambassador and uh, going through your experience with the PACT. Um, so uh, as I'm the advocacy intern at the World PACT Coalition, I will explain to everyone how you can become a, a PACT ambassador. Um, first, we are going to work on a few uh, online uh, campaigns on the next few months. So uh, we need your help. So if you want to become an ambassador, there are three projects in which you can work on. First, in December, we're trying to um, re 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 revive our social media. So on our Instagram account, we are um, like publishing reels about the environment, about protecting the nature. And um, you can go on our account and share our latest reels on your story and draw attention to our social media account because on January, we were doing an outreach campaign. We're going to publish prevention videos uh, on environmental principles that are key for us for the protection of the environment and to fight climate change the way it is right now. So we will need um, to um, 
a lot of you to help us to reach out to influencers, civil society, and institutions. Uh, we will uh, make teams uh, for the con to create contact lists and to say, send email chains and also um, to make new partnerships with organizations. We are also on many campaigns uh, with civil society organization in Geneva um, towards the recognition of, uh, towards the protection of human rights and uh, in the wake of climate change. And also uh, we'll be on a campaign like regarding um, the European, uh, uh, the European Convention of Human Rights and the right to health environment. So we are going to um, also like try to outreach to get to grow our audience so that we can like, really have like boost these campaigns that are like legal campaigns to improve the protection of the environment in our regional and international um, law. In March, uh, we are going to uh, ask you uh, to share about the most important environmental law principles um, that are to your eyes. Like what is the most important environmental law principle to you? And we will do a video uh, campaign with uh, all the ambassadors and um, we will try to also like do a lot of prevention and to raise awareness uh, uh, in regards to uh, the protection of the environment and environmental law um in the world and in our countries in our home countries so if you want to become a pact ambassador or help us in any way you can send us a resume and a short cover letter to contact at globalpactenvironment.org so it can be uh either in french or english as we are like bilingual um and uh, you can just explain tell us like where you come from uh, why would you like to help us and um, in which area you would like to help us like from the campaigns I told you about which one do you want to participate in and um, if you like good with social media or good uh, you have contacts in NGOs or if you are good with like video edition there's like so many things with which you can help us and as Sylvan and Pedro said it um, it doesn't have to require, to require a lot of your time. Uh, sometimes one or two hours a week is enough. Sometimes it's just helping on a big project and then like uh, just being available for a short period of time and then helping us again on a, at another moment. So feel free to send us applications and join the big global back family. So now we're going to get to the Q&A session you can send uh you can ask your question directly i think uh you can raise your hand and maybe i can activate your microphone or you can send your question through the chat Um, so we just had a question on the chat from Anton. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Thank you very much for your question. Um, so if I could just kick off by saying, uh, well, I'll read out the question first. Can you tell us about the piece that ambassadors have enjoyed the most about their work with the pact and what has been the most challenging? Um, so on my side, I've been part of the pack since I think June 2018. Um, when I originally started, 
I actually started because um, I was in Jan Aguila's class as well. And um, at the beginning, I was kind of just doing some translation work uh, from French to English for publications and things like that. Um, but I was invited to all of the meetings uh, to discuss like strategy, communications, how to get people on board, how to contact people um, in the best way, depending on the stakeholder. So you'll have a different strategy depending on, you know, if you're looking to attract students, if you're looking to attract um, NGOs, businesses. Um, so it really depends on like the role that you'd like. You can have more of a research role or you can sort of su you suggest things. Um, something that we're hoping to, to bring out is this idea of workshops. So any ambassador who wants to um, hold a workshop in like their local area or via Zoom um, could do so. So I guess what I really like is that the options, it's, it's really open um, and it's really for us to sort of make the most of it, if you see what I mean. Um, I know that I created a UK branch of ambassadors um, through my university. So I went, I was at Bristol Uni and I went back to um, the law department and asked if they could, um, you know, share uh, a document inviting people to apply. Um, and now we have like a UK branch of ambassadors, which is great. So I think it's just the opportunity to um, really spread the word in whatever way or form you'd like to. Um, and just being able to really take part in this project is amazing because you meet a lot of really cool people and um, loads of different stakeholders from all different countries. And I think it's just, yeah, I think it's just really great to be part of that. And sorry, I feel like I'm going a bit long winded here, but just to answer the, the end of your question, um, what's the most challenging? Probably the fact that all we can do is try and get support and sort of get people on board. But really, it's up to the states to, um, you know, to actually adopt the pack. So it's kind of frustrating. But yeah, hopefully we can just use this momentum now to, to push um, for an adoption. Uh, maybe I'll just add that um, I think the thing I've enjoyed the most is that it's quite a unique experience to be a part of uh, an international coalition, um, especially as as a uh, you know as a student, a, a younger person. There aren't that many kind of large international groups um, that you can kind of actively participate in, um, help see build from uh, from you know where they where they were three years ago to actually you know seeing progress through um, the the UN system and uh, other forms of international negotiation. So it's been really cool to like watch that process go along, kind of understand um, uh, understand a bit better the kind of policy making process at an international level um, as well as a domestic level when when you're involved in in more domestic campaigns to to push states to adopt. Um, or to, to support the pact, um, which I, I know a number of the ambassadors have been involved in. And, um, and, and yeah, as Roger said, it's, it's you know, uh, a, a challenge. And I think it's a challenge to know if what you're doing is, is actually helping or, or if, if, it, if it's making any progress, you know, it can kind of feel like you're treading water or doing something uh, not very useful if you're just looking at what yourself is doing. But I think if you kind of zoom out and see the larger picture and see what everyone else is doing and what everyone else is working on and, um, uh, the you know articles that people are publishing and the progress for the UN system and what the core team is doing, I think um, it becomes a really kind of cool uh, experience where you you really do learn a lot about about policy making and and how uh, how how that works at an international level, as well as meeting lots of cool people from around the world, of course. Yeah. I would like to say something short to answer Anton's question. Uh, maybe I don't know. I would probably one of the newer ambassadors. I joined the coalition like two months ago, two or three months ago, and I've, I have enjoyed a lot um, what uh, connecting with people all around the world with the same interest as you. So I've enjoyed like meeting and having some network, like also make, uh, making bigger your, your network for working to, on on these uh, also 
uh, getting to know people all around the world uh, that wants uh, to protect the environment and uh, uh, with so many different um, and nice studies because I'm, I'm a lawyer, but not all, all the people here and all, all the ambassadors are lawyers. So having different points of view and being we all so different makes this coalition a very nice place to be. And maybe the most challenging part is to convince the ones that do not believe on maybe climate change or the environmental protection, because it seems that um, some people doesn't care about the environment at all. So maybe that's the most challenging part, trying to convince the ones that do not believe on these or are, are doesn't want to to help with the environmental protection but here we are and we want to keep working on this yeah yeah exactly right um if i could just yeah i thought it would be interesting to touch on a question that actually i get fairly often um is why sort of it's going back to that question of why our support is important what actually is the link between support and the pact being adopted and you know as Sylvan was saying if you really zoom out of the picture and you look at the progress we've made yeah the pact hasn't been adopted yet but if you look back I mean in 2017 before this whole initiative um there have been no concrete steps taken whereas from 2017 we've managed to um, get the United Nations to negotiate, open negotiations twice. There's now been, well, we've contributed to the um, recognition of the, a right to a healthy environment as a human right. Um, the Global Pact Coalition had a huge role to play in that. So there's been significant steps forward in the past several years. And so if you just zoom out um, on a higher level, look at the progress we've made, you know, it's really surprising what can be done um, just by people with the same goal um, all over the world. So I would say that we just need to stay motivated and yeah. Uh, so we have another question from Alejandro. It's mandatory to certify field experience related to environmental issues. Uh, do you mean, by field experience, do you mean like a professional experience in the environmental sector? I'm not sure if... <laughs> if that is the case, that, then it, it's not uh, particularly mandatory. Maybe Francis can add anything else, but I was just like a, an undergraduate student when I joined as an ambassador. Um, you know, I happened to take an environmental law class. Uh, with uh, with you on on my exchange here, but um, but we're all from from varied uh, backgrounds, and I think um, part of the goal also is to to build um, kind of support outside people who are overly focused on the environment and who are you know only focused on the environment. So we want to uh, to build support among people who uh, you know might not pay so much attention to environmental issues, but um, but are interested in helping protect the environment and. Uh, and are interested in growing the Connect Coalition and their networks, because obviously, um, for those of us who are really in tune with environmental issues, most of our networks are already environmentalists and already support environmental issues. And so we're really hoping to uh, to build and, and grow the pack outside of those kind of narrower um, pro-environmental networks. Uh, yes, thank you, Sylvan. Uh, I wanted, uh, like, that's totally, like, um, true, Alejandro. Uh, your question is really good, uh, and I would add that um, that's the thing, like, we already, like, know a lot of environmentalists, and we already have a lot of environmentalists who join our course, and now we want to broaden our network. We want to have more people uh, from different fields of, with different life experiences coming and supporting us, so you, you don't need to certify our field experience uh, related to environmental issues to become an ambassador. You, you can just um, come with your background and uh, you know if you feel like you can uh, help us and uh, support us, then there is no like uh, re requirement uh, for that. Thank you. 
Yeah, and actually, um, Frances, you maybe know a bit more than me on this, but we are looking, um, obviously we welcome ambassadors from all over the world. Um, whatever your experience, it's just, you know, apply and um, we're more than happy to, um, to get you on board. Um, everyone can bring something to the table, be it through communications, you know, campaigns, whatever. Um, but one thing is there are certain zones or certain regions where we don't have a lot of ambassadors. So we have, you know, quite few in Europe, um, South America, but there's a lot of regions still where we, um, we really are hoping to develop the ambassador network. So I don't know, Frances, if you can talk maybe a bit more about that. Yeah, so we have ambassadors uh, in uh, Africa, um, South America, North America, in Europe. But for example, in Asia, we have a few uh, ambassadors, but like we don't have like a strong network. So we would like to expand our uh, Asian network. Uh, we don't have any ambassador in the Pacific Islands, for example. So we would like to, uh, yeah, have like more people from every every country every region so that because really the pact the, the idea of the pact is that it's a pact for all people it's a pact for everyone it's international and we want to represent like the most nations possible and that's why we have the ambassadors representing their countries it's like it's like this kind of spirit of uh, cosmopolitan spirit that we are like all together and that we join forces behind one goal, like the protection of our environment. But yeah, like if you're uh, working in finance or computer science and you want to help with the pact, you can totally help us. There are so many ways in which you can help us. So um, do not hesitate to, to um, try and join us and send us an email with your motivation. Does somebody else has uh, any question to ask? So um, besides from that, we have like um, another question that is um, um, that like, um, how would a global pact for the environment impact different regions in the, regions in the world? And what we think is that uh, if a global pact is adopted at the international level, uh, it will impact national uh, legislation and it will help uh, with uh, harmonizing uh, environmental law and human rights uh, in every country of the world. And um, as an ambassador, I think you can also see in uh, your country or as a student, whatever you like, everyone in its own country sees what are the things that are lacking in environmental law and in environmental protections. I think we can all like um, see that, identify the problems and we can see how a pact can be like use, useful, the adoption of a pact for our countries. So um, if there's uh, no more question, uh, uh, you can like the last call to questions and then maybe we'll wrap up this uh, webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'll probably just mention a last thing just to add on what you mentioned there, Frances. Um, so for those who aren't too familiar with um, international law or how it works in relation to national law. So just to give you an example, um, we talked about how there's sort of lack of consistency sometimes between environmental principles. You could get one country um, where there is an environmental principle that's um, recognized and upheld. Another one might not recognize it. And so this is really a way of, um, if you're setting a standard, if you, if you recognize a principle and it's clearly defined and clarified at an international level, that feeds down into, because it's legally binding, it feeds down into um, the national level, um, both through the legislature, so politicians who have to take into account that when they're developing policy, but also um, in the court system. So the judges who um, can then rely on the pact as a point of reference and it's know, know that it's not gonna change too much because it's consistent, it's in one place, it's codified, um, 
so that's really what we mean. So I hope that maybe clears it up a bit. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, Georgia. Thank you, everyone uh, who have assisted to uh, this webinar. Uh, we're going to wrap it up as the session is going to end. Uh, we thank you for uh, coming, uh, asking uh, your questions. We hope uh, we have resolved um, your questions and all your interrogations. Uh, you can still uh, contact us and join the coalition. Uh, we'd like, if you have any questions, you can contact our email address. We have the website globalpactenvironment.org and our days on social media is our, um, at Pact Environment. We are on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and also on TikTok. Like it's been uh, recent, but we are on TikTok and you can find us with Pact Environment. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And uh, if you like the initiative, join us. You're welcome anytime. Um, now I can have a nice evening and I'm uh, going to close this session. Bye. Thanks, everyone.